All right, folks, I am now joined with the Texas State champion, Anakin Stan. Yeah. From Norway, hi. live live from Norway right now. Directly from Norway. What yes. is what is the current time over there? Uh, it's 11 o'clock p.m. And, and you just flew in, you flew back today? I did. Or, well, yeah, I, I woke up 6 o'clock a.m. Monday morning. Okay. Houston time. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm not like, I don't know. What time is it for you now? Uh, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Yeah. yeah it's slept. about to be Wednesday over there. Yeah. I haven't slept yet. So. So this might be a great interview. I think everyone's really <laughs> looking forward to it. Um, I guess we'll just jump into the first question I have. All right. And, and, and this was kind of, I, I believe Nate Perkins interviewed you right after your win. And he, he asked the kind of same question, but in case people, you know, maybe t- turned off before the interview, uh, what does it feel like to be the first Norwegian player to have a win on the disc golf pro tour? <laughs> I like, I've had like a whole travel day trying to think through everything that has happened. And I, it's still very surreal to me. It mm-hmm. is. I, I think I need a couple more days because my body hasn't really, I don't think it understands what has happened and how big of a deal it is for Norwegian disc golf. Yeah. How, I guess for this, you know, for us in the States and for maybe some other people that aren't familiar with Norway, we hear all the time, Finland disc golf is massive. Obviously with Kristen Zatar, we hear how big it is in in Estonia. What is the disc golf scene in uh, Norway? Well, I would definitely say that it's growing both on the MPO and FPO side. Uh, we're still not where Finland is, but I mean, I I just made it to national, like the national news, and that's like a wow. really really big deal. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> so we've it's seen. Something. Yeah, we've seen kind of how crazy we've obviously have seen what Kristen Tatar has done in Estonia. Niklas won last week and he mm-hmm. made headlines back in Finland. And now yeah. you're making headlines back in Norway. I've kind of said this from the get-go. Disc golf, I think, needs to lean in more to the European side because the way the European, uh, you know, just the public and the sports media over there treats disc golf is vastly different than the way it treats it here in the States. Here, I guess, and I, I, guess. I think, I mean, honestly, if we really wanted to try to see the biggest growth in disc golf, this is a crazy idea. If we did like a 180 and said, you know what, let's just do a couple events in the States and let's run everything in Europe. <laughs> I think you actually might see like an explosion of the sport just because yeah, it seems like over there, I mean, a-, a B Anthony Barella won. It's not going to get picked up by anything. Not a single. Really? No, there will not be a single uh, newspaper. I, I I bet his local newspaper won't even write an article. It just disc golf yeah. in the States is just so far down the totem pole where over in Europe, it's just, it's awesome to see how much they love it over there. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, I just hope Norway will eventually get to the stage where we have like Estonia and Finland. So it's like one step at a time yeah. here in Norway too. So you've been playing disc golf for a little bit. I kind of bounced on your PDGA uh, stats or you know results page and looked and you've been playing for a while, but did you have a sports background before you got into disc golf? Yeah, so I've been doing figure skating and track and field. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Um, not like internationally, only like here in Norway though. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, first time I tried disc golf, I didn't really like it. I wasn't good at it at all. <laughs> Cause I mean, I had never really done like for track and field, I was, um, sprinting and I also did like, uh, hurdles. Yep. Yep. Hurdles. Yeah, hurdles. What do you, what do you guys call it? You guys call it something different over there? Uh, no, it's kind of the same. Oh, meaning. It, okay. But, but yeah, it's, in, yeah. it's in, it's in a different language. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So, so you're I, naturally kind of gifted in sprinting and hurdles. And when it came to disc golf, not so much. No, 
Uh, no, not really. I wasn't good like throwing anything. Like I still can't throw a ball. I'm so bad at throwing a ball, mm. like regular throw. Um, but at if least you could throw I, really well. You could be like a nasty softball pitcher. Lefties. Softball. You know that like left-handed, left-handed are like kind of prime for baseball and softball because the ball comes at a different, different spin and a different uh, release point. I so have like, no idea. <laughs> yeah. Cause like most oh. people are right-handed. So everyone's kind of used to a ball releasing here. So if you have someone that's really good at throwing lefty, it kind of messes with uh, the hitters minds, but continue on. Cause I, I, I want to hear a little bit more about this figure skating background. Um, has that has that translated to anything in disc golf do you think i think so like when i first started um trying to actually be good at disc golf um i was thinking a lot about like the rotation because okay. in figure skating when, like when you do the jumps when you do the spin you need to have like the the axe like mm-hmm. to spin around your own axe and i feel like that translated pretty good when it comes to the the throw as well yeah i could see that and you've also probably have you know years and years of building up that core that core and that rotational power which probably translates well um i actually was going to mention uh i saw because i was kind of going back and watching because unfortunately this week i was playing also when you guys were playing um (laughs) and so i had to go back and kind of watch some of the footage and I can't remember what hole it was, but it was the first big putt that you made in the final round. It was like a step putt. And it was it was kind of early on. Hole three, a, I think. Hole three. Yeah. And the way the way you ran to get your disc, <laughs> I in my head, I was like, I was gonna make a joke being like, it looked like you were a sprinter coming out of the blocks. And well, here you are telling me that you were. Because I I mean, you can, you can tell kind of a little bit, you know, disc golf is one of those sports where there are a lot of people playing that didn't really play anything else growing up. And you can kind of be like, yeah, that person didn't play any other sports just by the way they move, the way they run, the way they throw catch and seeing you run. I was like, that, that looks like someone that knows how to run. So that's, that's funny that, that you actually have that background. Yeah. Um, That's actually also funny that you mentioned it. Cause like I was talking, um, uh, on my way back home to Tom and he's like like you you run your like I run when I make the circle two putts and Kristen just walks so confident like she yep. just walks and yeah I don't know I just it's I don't even well, think that, that would... <laughs> do you think that would ever change do you think that's something that uh, you know, let's say three years from now you've made hundreds and hundreds of big circle two putts is that something that does change like, or, or are you saying that you like the idea of running in after it? Cause there are different people on different sides of the fence on this one. Yeah. I I've heard that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, for now I, yeah, it's just comes automatically. So I don't yeah. know in the future what will happen. Yeah. You're not, you're, <laughs> you're not in your head or... thinking about it. You're just going off of instincts. Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> um, I do want to shift now a little bit to, like where where are you at now in your career? So you you basically at one point in time decided that you were going to play competitive disc golf. Mm-hmm. Did, what was the shift of, I guess, tell me kind of the origin of the shift of like, you said that you weren't very good. So like at, how long did it take you to get to the point of where you're like, actually, I'm decent at this now. I can play competitive. And then kind of lead us to where you are now because everyone is also kind of all over the spectrum here of, oh, I just do it when I have free time or, oh, no, this is like what I do for a living. Um, mm-hmm. So kind of lead us to the through your entire kind of career of disc golf, I guess. All right. Yeah. So it was like uh, 2015 when I first tried it. And it wasn't up until 2017 when I said, like, I want to try to actually start practicing more and become good. And 2018 was the first PDGA tournament I played. And I know, like, in Norway, it was like, you just go straight on to FPO. Like, there's no, there wasn't, like, any amateur division. Because you guys have probably only a handful of people even playing FPO. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're you're immediately in with people that are like, I've been playing competitive disc golf for years. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you think that was, that was like a benefit? What? Pardon? Oh, I was going to say, do you think that was a benefit that you kind of got thrown into the fire real quickly? I guess I, well, I didn't know there were other options. Oh, okay. Because were in Norway. So I was like, okay, that, this is the division I'm playing now and that's it. And it was the Norwegian championship that I started oh, with. Oh, wow. Yeah. Big uh, one. <laughs> yes. I was on the wait list and then I got in and like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm here now. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and then I took fifth place. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. And from there, uh, that was actually the first time that um, formally, uh, now we are disc golf, they rebranded. So okay. uh, that was the first time they saw me play and i've been with them ever since is that a norwegian company yeah uh, we are okay. disc golf is norway's biggest distributor of this equipment oh okay nice yeah. okay very cool and yeah so they they picked me up and they saw the pen potential in me and also at that time i did like i have a master's degree in economics and uh, business okay. economics um, so I did that and I had like a full-time job up until, uh, we're in 2004, uh, December, 2000, no, 2022. So, okay, yeah. So almost two years ago, it was just over two years ago. Yeah. So, so last um, year was 2023 was your first year doing disc golf full-time. Yeah. Like it's kind of like, I still have like a small percentage, uh, of my previous job okay uh, but it's very flexible <laughs> gotcha so <laughs> you're able I to kind of work on the road and do hours here and there yeah or when i'm home or yeah okay yeah. nice like, and you and, and that's when you started touring uh you came over to the states and played a couple of tournaments in the states yes uh, okay because i said to my sponsors like well, like i i have this goal long-term goal i want to become the world champion one day mm. how can we make that happen like how and then we uh, they come up with this deal so like with sear bags we are disc golf and also pcs construction is part of that deal um and then we kind of went with a five-year contract so i had like five i five years starting from 2023 three Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is my second year with that contract, and yeah. When when were you? When was like the first tournament that you played? Because I'm assuming you know you jumping into your very first competitive tournament, getting fifth. You were probably like, hmm. I, I would love to see. At a certain point, you're like, I would love to see where I stand with women outside of Norway. So where mm -hmm. where and who was your first kind of eye opening of like what level you need to get to, to compete, not with just people in Norway, but worldwide. I think it was the year after 2019. That was when I first tried the Euro tour. Okay. And I remember it was in Denmark in Cockadale and Kristen was there. And, okay. There you go. That's a good and, one to test yourself against. And Antonia Faber, a German, German FPO player, uh well known and i did i think i had one round like the second round that i played with them because i played the first round pretty good and that was when i actually saw like wow like mm. they're really good and i i want to be like them <laughs> what were parts of your game that you saw them like what were things that they were doing that you're like okay now i know what i need to go work on First of all, the distance. Oh, okay. That was the first thing I saw, and also just the precision in the the th shots. It's like, like consistency. Consistency, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they they don't miss very often. No. Um, I've always <laughs> said, you know, no one throws. You know, you look at your tournament. You look at Anthony Barella, two winners from this past week. If I asked you guys, hey, did you throw every shot perfect? You would say absolutely not. No. So and, no one ever I guess throws. That's impossible though. Yes, no one ever throws a perfect shot. But right. the people that win, their bad shots or when they mess up, 
aren't really that bad. And right, I think right. that's where it is. It's like everyone throws bad shots, mm-hmm. but the people at the top, their bad shots are way better than the people at the bottom's bad shots, exactly, right? Exactly. So, um, okay. So you went and saw Kristen, got to kind of see where you were at. Uh, and then, you know, having this big lofty goal of, I want to be a world champion. You now came over to the States. We're able to play a little bit. Uh, you actually found some success at some tournaments. I remember last year mm-hmm. seeing your name pop up on a couple of leaderboards and, you know, I'm paying attention as best as I can. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to pay attention to MPO and FPO, but I, I saw that. your name pop up. I think I saw you play a little bit and I, I feel like I'm a decent judgment of, uh, you know, that was one of my things for ultimate Frisbee was being able to, you know, pick kids to be on the team of like, this kid's got potential or this kid doesn't. And I remember watching you throw, watching you putt, thinking in my head, this could be someone that could be a, a problem on the FPO at some point, right? Just with your right. style of playing your putting and here you are actually winning. <laughs> um, what, what other, I guess, improvements other than distance and consistency kind of led to where you are now? Cause you made, I mean, from jumping into a tournament you know, for your first time to now winning on tour, that's a very short time frame for being able to do that. So what are some things that you worked on? Maybe different practice regimens? Did you practice a lot more? What were things that kind of led to get your first win? Mm. Well, I mean, when I first got the deal that I could have this as my main job uh, last year, I was able to practice way more and also take the time for rest because I Mm. think that's really important for the body to function on the course, right? And also... Yeah, just having more time to practice, like during off season now, I mostly been inside the garage. <laughs> throwing. Okay. Yeah. Um, While throwing into nets and putting inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have the the basket inside our house, and yeah. All right, I think we're back. Sorry about that. A little technical <laughs> issues, but we're good to go. I think we left off with you kind of explaining your off season or your practice regimen where you were basically doing a lot of work inside your house, throwing into a net, mm-hmm. putting inside. How much how much practice are you getting going into the season outside? I mean, is it even feasible over in Norway? Uh, no, I haven't really practiced out here in Norway, but we went to Spain for 12 days before heading to, before I came to the States. So that was pretty much it. How, how like kind of, how much of a difference is it when you have been throwing inside all, you know, for months and then you go outside and you start having to throw, you know, with wind and whatnot? Uh, yeah, that is kind of an issue because, I mean, I, I was focusing on changing, like, my form. Okay. Um, what are but, some things that you were working on? Um, it form was, wise. like, uh, aligning my body better to actually, like, what we talked about, like, having the right, uh, the axe turn around mm-hmm. it and not fall over to my left foot. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. Try, trying to more rotate this way versus shifting to where now you're, yeah. you're, you can kind of cause some shoulder dip and all of that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you also find that that increased your power at all? Did you see a power increase oh, uh, yeah. coming, coming out? Definitely. Um, so when I came to Texas now, it was like, it felt easier to get the distance. Well, at first I, I felt like I did maybe have some timing issues. And I mean, that's fine. It's still early in the season. Mm -hmm. And, but also my sidearm, I definitely have seen improvements in my sidearm now. Nice. Very nice. Um, So we're not expecting to see you come back on tour until the West Coast swing, which I believe OTB and Portland are your next two tournaments. Are you going to be playing? Uh, Yeah. First, uh, I'll do a Copenhagen Open, which is one of the main events here in Europe. In Europe. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, the West Coast swing with OTB, as I said, and uh, Portland and Beaver State. And Beaver State. Okay, so you are going to play in some of the European events while uh, we're doing like Jonesboro, Champions Cup, those 
Was there mm-hmm. ever a thought of coming and doing Champions Cup? Well, actually, uh, I thought we only needed an invitation. Like, so I wasn't qualified. Okay. To begin with. And I, I somehow thought that you had to do the Monday qualifier to get in last year. I think you can definitely get into the tournament. Uh, if yeah, you want, if you wanted to play, I, I think register a later point. But then I had already like <coughs> made my plan for the season. Yes. Um. So, so no Champions Cup. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say I'm sure I'm sure they would be able to somehow find a way to get you into that tournament. Um. It yeah. it would it would be crazy to me that a a winner on tour wasn't able to play in the first or I guess the second major of the year. Um. Mm-hmm. So outside of that. You know, that's as far as I'm, I know, that's all that you've posted. Is there any changes? You know, does this win make any changes towards the end of your season? Uh, well, uh, I haven't like posted the full schedule yet. Uh, so I'll do like uh, the West Coast swing and then I'll do the, the rest of the Europe swing. Okay. Uh, during the summertime. And I now just got qualified for European Open, which is great. Mm-hmm. And then I'll come back for Worlds and whatever I'm qualified for after Moving that, forward. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, to me, I, I, I think you should be able to play in any event that you want to play. And I don't know if that is necessarily the case, but I think you have an argument. If you win a tour event, you should be able to, you know, qual- for where the field is right now, I could see like in the future, Yes, mm-hmm. maybe that doesn't work. Maybe if you win an event, you can qualify into, you know, four or six of the next events or something like that. But uh, the way that the FPO field, as far as like the depth goes, a winner should just be able to automatically get into every event that they want to. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but if it isn't, I, yeah, that's, I have to look into that to see how it works, or if it's still just the points. Well, you got my vote. If you if if it comes down to you know <laughs> social pressure. Uh, right. you have you have my vote there. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so you talked about you know you were increasing your distance. What is your your like typical stock distance off the tee? Um. Well, I haven't really had time to measure it right now, but I think it's like I feel like I'm more comfortable throwing. Are you good with meters? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think everyone's decent with meters. I wouldn't say I'm great. Yeah. I would say decent. Um, I think 110, maybe closer to 115 meters. Okay, so that's like basic. Uh, that's close. To like I want to say like 350 feet to 360 feet. Something like that, I guess. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. So there was a couple holes this past weekend that was like kind of toward you know a couple par threes where it was pretty much. Um, close to your max distance. I think there was like a couple that were like 360 feet plus par threes. Um, let's, uh, yeah. you know, now that we're talking about the actual disc golf this past week, let's jump into going in. I'm just going to go straight into the final round because I think your first round, super consistent. Second round, super consistent. And from everyone that played, it looked like you were you know, Kristen had an incredible second round, didn't play mm-hmm. that great her first oh, round. Yeah. Um, Owen had two pretty decent rounds as well. But from everyone, it looked like you just were like, went out, followed a game plan, executed. Second day, went out, followed a game plan, executed. And so now you're going into the final round. You're tied with Owen Scoggins, who is having an incredible start of her season. Uh, and then you have three shots ahead of what I have said, the best female disc golfer we have ever seen, Kristen Tatar. What is that feeling going in that night? Not even the day. You're now like trying to figure out how to go to sleep. How how is that? How how is that whole process? Oh, so I that evening was mm, I had a lot of nerves and I told like I was staying with Katharina, Haiti, and Linus. Okay. And I said like I I wanna play Uno. I wanna do something. <laughs> So we played Uno and I, yeah, we just had a lot of fun doing that and also some other games and yeah. And then hey, Haiti and Katharina went to bed and I was still like, I, I can't, I'm not ready to go to bed yet. I still need to calm down and 
yeah, so me and Lena's, we were just talking about like trying to plan maybe something for West Coast Swing where to stay. Like, yeah. Just try and, to keep your mind busy. Yes, definitely. Is that a, is that a, you know, looking back now, is that something that you are happy that you guys play first and you play in the morning versus your tea time being at 3.45 the mm -hmm. next day and now you're like, what am I doing all day? Right. I would probably had a harder time <laughs> <laughs> just having to wait the whole day. Like I didn't, yeah, when we do the U.S. women's it's and when we play later, it just messes up the routine. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot different, right? If having to, you know, wake up yeah. and figure out what am I going to do all day before I go right. out and play. Yeah. Um, all right, so now let's talk about you. You you've somehow slept for however many hours you slept. You've woken up. You've got breakfast. You did. You know, you've you've made your way all the way now to the first tee, and you hear mm -hmm. your name being called on the first tee. You hear, uh, you know, you have your competitors behind you. And at this point in time, you know that it's either own you or Kristen winning. Everyone else is pretty much out of the tournament. It's you three. What are the nerves now? What, what, what are the thoughts stepping onto the tee pad? Are you able to like lock into a different kind of mode or how, how does that work? Uh, yeah, well, at least for the two first uh, days, I was like, I felt like I was, I was nervous on hole one, but not, nothing like day three i had way more nerves going into that and it kind of was showing in my first shot <laughs> it was short it was low it was not good and also but it was in balance but it was in balance yes <laughs> and then again the second shot i was really not feeling it and i just yeah i wasn't really using it how i wanted to and i almost thought that was ob mm. um but it stopped, like, yeah, the fence was stopping in, luckily. And after that, like, they they took birdies and I had a par. I was happy with the par, moving on, next shot. And then I felt like, okay, I, I have nothing to lose, right? So <laughs> I can just chill. I can continue with what I've been doing the other days and just following my routine, stick to that. And because I know, I know how to do it. Yeah, it, uh, you, I mean, obviously from a bird's eye perspective, that's kind of what I gathered too. Your first couple shots, very kind of uncommitted of mm -hmm. where you're like trying not to make a mistake. <laughs> yeah. And then it looked like you kind of settled in and you're like, all right, we're, we're playing disc golf today. Yeah. And let's, let's see who can play the best disc golf. And you kind of settled into your round. Were you keeping track of the scores? throughout the round? Were you looking hole to hole? What was going on? Were you paying attention to, I just birdied, Kristen just parred, I gained an extra stroke on, where were you at with like the score keeping? So I'm usually always bad at knowing what my score is, what other uh, players score is. So I think when, when I get to hole three, I, I have no idea. Oh, okay. And I think that's good. I think that's is really that good. not even registering when you're when you're like calling out the scores on the previous hole where they're like, Anakin, what'd you get? And you're like three. Kristen, what'd you get? Four. You're not like, ooh, I just beat Kristen by a stroke there. Is that not even registering? It's, it's your... kind of well, I do hear the scores and I like I see them take the birdies, but then again, I still I I guess it's almost like I forget where we started. Okay. And you're not I, looking at the score, the guy that's holding the scores either. Did you have one of those guys? No. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you did. It. I, I, we should, I we think so. Won. I yeah. think they had, I think they had that at the tournament. Okay. So you're not paying attention at all. At what no. point during the round do you like, look, I'm assuming it, or are you going completely blind? We've, we've heard people do it before of where they tap out on 18. They're like, I had no idea I won. Yeah, uh, no, I was. I decided that I was going to look at the scores on hole 17. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> and, I had a feeling. Yes. <laughs> the way and, you played that hole was beautiful. It was the exact way you should have played the hole. Yeah, so because I feel like my game plan would not have changed on any of the other holes anyways. Well, let's talk about that. What did you think of the course? Because I, watching it, I kind of felt the same way of where 
other than hole, I want to say it might have been eight, I believe, that had the Mando kind of pinched on the dog leg. Mm -hmm. Other than that hole in 17 and 18, I had a hard time seeing anyone taking a bogey unless you like three putted, had a roll away. Yeah. It, so you kind of had to find like get on the birdie train. It, there wasn't like really, did you, do you think that kind of helped you? Because you got to the point of where obviously you guys were all over the place. Owen took the lead for a little bit. Then I think Kristen tied for a little bit, but mm -hmm. you always were either tied one shot back or in the lead. And then down the stretch, you were in the lead. Do you think that kind of paid, uh, play to your advantage of where you're like, Hey, I just need to keep putting my pedal to the metal instead of having a bunch of holes where it's like, Ooh, like, should I play safe here or should I be aggressive? Do you think yeah. that was advantageous for your first uh, win? Yeah, I think so. Just not having to think and make hard decisions on every hole. So of like, should I lay up or not? Cause 17, like you said, that was the first hole that I was like, she needs to just throw it in bounds. Like you yeah. don't even need to go for the basket. And you threw, what would you end up throwing off the tee? A putter of some sort? Yeah, I went with the zone. I okay. first had the verdict in my hand Ooh. and I was about <laughs> to like go with it. Cause I'm like, well, I, maybe I need the, bird. Maybe, should I take, try to get a real birdie, like easier birdie? <laughs> and I was like, well, why, why? Just, you can throw the heiser like, yeah. with some power and it will still be good and I will still have like because at the end of the day if Kristen makes that putt or if she throws a better shot and makes mm -hmm. the putt you're going to into hole 18 tied yeah. yeah so you you still have the ability to win the tournament you're not losing the tournament by laying up there yeah. uh but you definitely could have put yourself in a terrible spot if you throw OB I know on that yeah. drive so thankfully you didn't uh <laughs> And then 18, how, uh, how, how nervy were you when that disc released your hand that it came out a little high and was heading to the tree? Oh my. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, like my game plan is to go with compass on the right side of the tree. Oh, Cause there's okay. a lot of room, <laughs> but people didn't see that. That was what I was trying to do because <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> were you able, did you ever practice the forehand, the lefty forehand on that hole? Yeah. Or is that too far of a cover com to comfortably throw a forehand across? No, I guess I could have done that, but I think it just felt more natural to go backhand. Go backhand, yeah, because you have like a lot of room on the right side. When rather than if I go skipping the towards the OB, yes, yeah, I thought you did a great job of that as well, throwing the shots that always were. You know, if you did miss your mark, it was always going away from the OB versus towards the OB mm -hmm. uh, on, you know, a handful of those shots kind of that uh, you were throwing with OB on uh, down the fairway. What point, like, did you know instantly as soon as Kristen's disc went OB, did you know, like, all right, I, I, I just won this tournament? Well, I, I, w my brain was working really hard. To try to calculate the numbers. Yeah, I was just. That's where you should turn around, look at the score, and be like, <laughs> "Oh wait, I'm up by one. This is yeah, over." I, yeah, I did so much calculation in my <laughs> head right there, and I was like, "Wait, wait, what does that mean?" And I was looking at one guy in the crowd. I was thinking about it today. Like, I, I was looking at some some guy in the crowd and he was like, he was nodding and like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's happening. And then we have the long walk to get to the basket. Yes. And I, I, I did have to ask Sarah, like, can I lay this up? Who did you I, end up asking? Uh, I, yeah, I asked Sarah. Cause I was like, Oh, Hokum. Oh, okay. Yeah, Hokum, yeah. Cause I was like, I couldn't think clear. <laughs> you, right needed a, <laughs> you need a secondary opinion. Yeah. This yeah. is where I think having a caddy, Missy Gannon was on the podcast last week. Mm -hmm. Her husband's on uh, on the bag for her. Mm -hmm. And they have a thing of where she doesn't really uh, have him tell her scores at all. Mm -hmm. But he will say something like, hey, you need to birdie this hole. If like the oh, scores really? start getting like close, right? And they had like, I think they had a buffer of like two shots or something. Yeah. Of where if it got to that point. So like that would have been a perfect time for you to have a caddy to be like, <laughs> 
no, you lay this up yeah. 1000% <laughs> and they give you that reassurance. Cause yeah. I, cause I, I, we've seen it before. I don't know if you paid attention, um, to, I believe it was two years ago, uh, when Paul Macbeth and Kyle Klein were going down the wire to USDGC, Kyle Klein's score, I believe was imported incorrectly into the PDGA live. Like one of the, you know, cause we have his volunteers doing it. Right. Yeah. And so the, the volunteer put it in incorrectly. And so I don't know how much you can trust that. Uh, now it's a little bit better because it, it shows up when there's like a conflict, right? Yeah. And you can't really move forward. Mm -hmm. But still, like I'm with you too of where it's like, I want to like double, triple check. Like, can I lay this up? Yeah. Um, so once Sarah basically was like, yes, you're good to go. Then that kind of clicked of like, holy cow, I just won. Yeah. Then I was like, what, what did I just do now? What? But <laughs> I knew like... That was when my hands really started to shake. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> for that, I was terrified to mess up that last upshot because I almost couldn't feel my hand. Yeah. <laughs> it was just all that I had to like just try to shake it off. And so you got a putt right handed. Oh, well, that, <laughs> that would have been weird. <laughs> Take the pressure off. Yes. <laughs> So, it's yeah. nice. That, yeah, it's nice though that um, you know, it's one of those situations of where you just have to put yourself in those positions to where that can happen, right? You mm -hmm. got the lead, and uh, you know, had you had made had a birdie hole eighteen, who knows what would have ended up happening? But you played so well that you didn't have to do that, right? And yeah. and now you have that under your belt to where you have felt the pressure. I mean, the tee shot on hole 18 had to feel like the most nervous shot, scariest shot ever. Uh, and it's not like you have some random person behind you that you're like, <laughs> oh, they could maybe mess up. You're like, no, they're probably going to, they're probably going to birdie this hole. Yeah. And um, I was looking at Christine's shot and I thought that was parked. It took a big skip, but yeah. it came in quick and that can happen out there. Yeah. Um, so now you have that experience, so you know what it feels like. And so now, you know, I think we're all looking forward to hopefully you getting back to that point and actually having like maybe a Nicholas moment of where you have to make the putt to win. Right. Because yeah. I think <laughs> I think in the moment we all want your situation of where it's like, oh, I'm I can just lay up, tap in and win. But dreaming i think we all would love to have like that 30 footer right right and you make it crowd goes nuts <laughs> and all that so hopefully hopefully you get that moment who knows maybe it'd be at the world championship that would Always that would be, be the best spot to do it at oh yeah um okay next question i have a couple more and then we'll let you go because i know it's getting late there do you feel you know you you've mentioned your distance you know that that was one area that you needed to work on do you feel like there are certain courses that you can't compete to win? <laughs> well, there's a reason why I don't play Jonas Borough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, well, at least from my experience last year, I, I just couldn't figure that, that out. It was something. Are there some holes that are just kind of too far? Cause that's one thing that yeah. I think is, is a big difference right now for, uh, some FPO players and others is mm -hmm. there are some FPO players that can only, and this is what I've talked about, like with own Scoggins, she's got a great backhand and a great forehand, but she throws flex shots. She doesn't have a hyzer flip that can turn and get max distance. Mm -hmm. And so some courses she goes to, she can maybe birdie 14 of the 18 holes mm -hmm. and she's having to beat people that could birdie all 18 holes. All yeah. Do you kind of feel that is like an area of your game that you still are, are looking to try to improve to where you're like, Hey, I can go to any course, any tournament and I can win my game. Cause you have, I would say watching you play, you have all the tools. You've got a great forehand, a great backhand. You can throw eight different angles. You have a great putt. The distance is like the only thing of like, if you could gain like 30 more feet, do you feel, do you feel like that's something that you're going to try to figure out? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm looking at Haiti uh, mm -hmm. and how far she can throw. And that's kind of like, oh, I want to have that. This and it looks, it can make like the longer courses easier. But then again, I, 
because I, I did make my schedule before I know how far I could throw this season. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe Jonas Bar would fit me better this year. Than but, last year. Yeah. Compare, and especially also now that I have a more, like a better sidearm. Because I mm. felt it didn't come up as a lefty friendly course somehow. Or I just. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think OTB also might be a good test uh, for distance as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and just kind of gauging your distance with, you know, some of the top throwers that you'll most likely be playing with. Cause I'm assuming when you come back, you probably are going to be on one of the feature cards at a, a OTB or you should be on one of the feature cards at OTB. So that will be uh that'll be exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Open bag. Is that, uh, is that going to stay open bag throughout this season? Have you gotten any emails? Have you gotten any calls after your win of, you know, manufacturers saying, Hey, well, I had someone reaching out like about like testing some discs okay. and yeah. And I, well, I do have a manager, so I'll forward whatever comes in to, to him. Is that something you're open to? Yeah, if like, someone comes knocking and asking, like, "Hey, we would like your sponsors that you currently have. Would you be able to still? Would you be able to sign like a exclusive deal with a manufacturer?" Yeah, that will be possible. Like, I, I right now, I love my bag being able to pick whatever I want to. Mm -hmm. But of course, if the right offers comes to the table, then yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it's open we, for discussion. <laughs> We uh we have a few people that listen to this podcast, so if uh <laughs> if if you guys are at all interested, I would highly you know what's the best way of reaching out to you through uh, Instagram uh, or yeah Instagram DMs, and that will kind of get to your manager, and then you can go from there. Yeah. Okay. There you have it. All right, we're gonna end it. Last question. This is a fan favorite. People want to know pet peeves and i always like asking this question to international players because i'm curious to see kind of what your pet peeves are you know how your pet peeves are different from players over here in the state so what is it that bugs you drives you nuts gets under your skin that either other players competitors do or some of your friends do at local uh you know when you're out playing with your friends or anything disc golf related pet peeves Mm. Uh, oh, that is a hard one though. Cause I usually don't like, I mean, you're unaffected. <laughs> well, I try to at least, but one thing that comes to mind, I think it's like, um, we have the word, um, sin, like when, like when you miss a pot, for okay. instance, and, or if, if it goes like, yeah, usually when someone says like, oh, sin, when I, when I miss a pet, it's like, it's, it kind of means like, oh, um, I'm like, nice sorry, try. I'm sorry. Or like, oh, that's, oh. yeah. And like, well, <laughs> if, well, it was, if it wasn't a good pet, then it's like, I, I don't need to hear that. <laughs> it's, it's like similar to the person that says like, oh, that was a really good shot, even though it went out of bounds. It's like, oh, well, it had a great flight. And you're like, I don't, maybe. I, I don't really care if it had a good flight. It did not go in bounds. Yeah. Okay. So people that are yeah, people that come up to you and say nice putt after you throw it straight into the cage from 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, it looked good. It's like, well, okay. It did. Cool. But well, it I did. mean, I don't get affected by it, but it's something that I, I thought about before. Like, I don't, I don't think I need to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather not hear it than actually do hear it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. That's a good one. Hey, we never know what people are going to say. We've had, uh, we've had people say all sorts of different, uh, answers on here. So that's a good one. Yeah. Um, all right. I'll leave it with this. Anything else? Would you like to, uh, plug anything, any, anything coming out? Do you have a disc maybe coming out from this past win? Anything like that? There we're working on something. So yeah. <laughs> Make sure to follow you on Instagram. Yes, Do you want to plug your Instagram up there? Yeah. What, what is your Instagram for those that aren't following? Uh, it's my name, Anakin Stan. Okay, there it is. Follow. Yeah. I think it is your name. Yes, I just double checked for you just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs>